G'day everyone, welcome to Mark and Cars Porsche Talk, the podcast where we talk about all things Porsche. If you love air-cooled, water-cooled, rear engine, front engine, or even mid-engine, there'll be something here for you. But most importantly, we'll talk to the people who are passionate about our favorite brand. I'm your host, Mark, from the YouTube channel, Mark and Cars. Thanks for taking the time to support the channel, have a listen, have a view. Feel free to share any input, suggestions, ideas through the comments, reviews, or even boring old email. you find me on most social media as Mark and Cars. Before we get into it today, a just quick thank you to my channel sponsors, Bowden's Own Australian Made Car Care Products. I use them, love them, keep a little red car nice and clean and shiny too, and I think most people appreciate that as well. It's available at most auto stores here in Australia or online. Just Google Bowden's Own. Also, Rec Watches. I'm wearing a 901. They're a Danish watch company that design and manufacture watches with an automotive theme. If you're a car nut, there's a good chance to make a watch using parts from your favorite brand. Mine's made from recycled 911 parts. Amazing features, world-class parts and movements. It's the ultimate automotive enthusiast. So check them out at recwatches.com. Anyway, today we have a celebrity from the cycle world internationally recently retired Simon Gerrans. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Now, I know quite a few people who listen to the podcasts will know you as an ex-professional athlete. Those who don't, Simon, give us a brief overview of what you've done in your career to date. Yeah, so I've basically spent my entire sort of adult life as a professional cyclist. I moved to, to Europe. I started racing in, here in Australia at, uh, in my sort of late teens, moved to Europe as a 19-year-old, as a where I, I lived for the next 21 years, sort of chasing my dream, following my passion and, and getting sort of to the top echelons of, of uh, professional cycling. Um, had, uh, had a great career, uh, competed in the Tour de France a number of times and um, had a couple of nice victories along the way. And yeah, now I'm 41 years of age, been out of the professional sport for uh, a couple of years and, and recently moved back to Australia. Great. And for, again, you, whilst I am a cycle enthusiast, it's not why I've got you here today. What do you drive? Uh, so yeah, my, my car of choice is a, is a Porsche 356A, um, which I've had for, I had for a number of years. So I've always kept it here in Australia. I bought it here in Australia um, some time ago, uh, and it was always my uh, my little toy I like to take out it's, uh, when I got back to Australia at the end of every cycling season uh, in my off season. So, yeah, um, I think it's because I have the Porsche is, uh, is why I'm, I'm here with you today, Mark. <laughs> it certainly is. I've admired the car over a, a number of years through social media when you've uh, – obviously been in that off season back to Australia and done all your preparation training and things leading into the tour down under in the Australian championships was a, it's in the peak of our summer for listeners that aren't aware. Tell me, um, when did you get the car? What year? Uh, so I bought the car in 2010 uh, yeah. and I bought the car the year I turned 30. Uh, so it was the, the 356s I admired for a number of years before that. Um, and by the time I was 30, I finally got to a point uh, in my life that uh, I could afford to sort of make a bit of a, a luxurious spend. Um, it's, uh, it was obviously a, a lot cheaper now than what it would be to purchase the same car. Uh, back, it's a lot cheaper back then what it would be to purchase the same car now. Um, so I, I stretched myself a little bit and, and bought myself a 30th birthday present, which was a 356A. It is, it is a very pretty one. I'll actually include an image of it on the video of anyone's List, if anyone's watching this podcast and also link, I'll put a link below to your socials where there's plenty of it in that, in that information. Now, for those that are listening, not watching, colour, exterior, interior. Yeah, so it's a uh, silver exterior, red interior, um, which is not, which is very classic. Yeah, it's not the original colour. Um, I bought the car, it obviously been, had been restored uh, since I purchased it. So it was an American delivered car. Uh, it was bought into Australia, I think probably 10 years or so before uh, I purchased it. The person who imported it, um, restored it, converted it. It was, I think, a, a sort of an off-white uh, colour originally. Um, so it was restored. It changed hands once or twice before I purchased it. Um, I bought it out of Queensland and, and bought it down to Victoria. Um, and because I was largely living overseas, I'd really only get the opportunity to drive it a couple of times a year. Um, so my dad had the pleasure of, of taking out for a monthly uh, spin around the block. And it's quite funny when I when I 
when I just moved back to Australia, like I said, late last year, um, he drove the car down to me in Melbourne, handed me the keys and said, well, I've been babysitting this for you for the, for the past 10 years. It's, it's over to you now, uh, which was really nice. Yes, yeah, so that it sounds great. The I was going to ask you about only coming back, like being a three five six owner. I know they don't like starting if you don't drive them regularly. So I was going to ask you about that. So it's good to hear that your dad was driving the car monthly. I'm surprised he gave it back at all. Uh, yeah, well, I think he he felt an enormous pressure, yeah. <laughs> funnily <laughs> enough, driving it around because he he's probably quite aware that the value of the car was going up and up. Um, so I think he was a little bit nervous when he drove it. So, um, yeah, so I think it was a bit of a weight off his shoulders actually. Yeah, good one. And uh, you're, I know historically you grew up Mansfield, Victoria. Yeah, that's right. I grew up in country Victoria, sort of largely a farming community, more more and more touristy now. Um, yeah, I grew, grew up on a, a beef cattle farm uh, around about 20 kilometres out of out of Mansfield. Uh, so I used to trudge in there every day on, on the school bus and every now and then ride my bike into school as well. Yeah, good um, I lived up there until I was uh, around 18 before moving to Melbourne. Uh, where I lived for, for a year before heading off to Italy. Yeah, great. And dad's still in Mansfield? Yeah, my folks are still in Mansfield. Um, one of my brothers, well, I have two brothers. One of them lives up in the area with his family too. Uh, my younger brother, he actually lives in Spain. So he works in the, in the cycling industry in um, as an osteopath. Yep. Um, but yeah, still have a lot of ties to Mansfield and, and, and country Victoria. Yeah, okay. Look, for listeners who are unaware of the part of Australia we're talking about, it's sort of like the foothills of the high country, Alpine region, Victoria. So the pretty good place to have to take a three, five, six out on a monthly drive, ultimately. Lots of big, long planes before you hit lots of windy roads. Yeah, it's a beautiful part uh, of Australia. As you, as you mentioned, there's, um, there's a couple of sort of nice plains as well. There's plenty of mountains and, and some beautiful scenery to, to drive a, a, a vintage car around. I was, I'm quite pleased from our conversation here. It sounds like you've you did a bit of due diligence and had a good understanding of the 356 when you purchased it. So you didn't just say, that's a pretty little car, that's what I want, which can be the nuance, especially of younger 356 owners. You're you're the youngest 356 owner I've interviewed. In fact, probably the youngest I know who's gone out and bought one. I'm aware of a few owners who have inherited them who are younger, but why? Why 356? Well, I had mine, I bought mine when I was 30, uh, funnily enough. So this I've had it, point. Yeah. yeah, I've had a number of years now. Um, uh, why the 356? Uh, funnily enough, I've, I was first introduced to 356. There was a, a bike shop in Melbourne um, that was supporting me uh, when I was returning to Australia. And one of the owners of the bike shop had a 356. And I first saw it and I thought, wow, that is an amazing looking car. Um, so it was the aesthetics that I first, that I first fell in love with, with the 356. Um, at that point in time, I was in my early 20s, sort of racing at an amateur level. So, um, you know, I could barely afford the shirt on my back, let alone let alone a, a, a car of that nature. So, you know, at that point, I just admired the cars and I started to look into it a little bit more and more. Then over the years, I would sort of, you know, scan websites and 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 the local club scene every now and then. I'd, I'd run into the, the Victorian 356 club out uh, run, uh, club out on a on a club run so I'd stop and admire all the cars um, I got to meet a few people within the club um, someone local from where I grew up in Mansfield had one as well so yeah, I used great. to speak to him about his um, to eventually coming around up to my my 30th birthday in 2010 I thought you know what I think it's it, it's time that I bought myself one of these and, and what better occasion than your 30th birthday to buy one um, at that point in time I was I was based in in Monaco and surrounded by, you know, very, very successful people driving, you know, the latest supercars and they all had Ferraris and, and uh, Lamborghinis and whatnot. But I kind of thought, you know, if I'm going to get myself a, a nice car, I'd like to get something that's classic um, that I'm going to have forever um, and it's only going to go up in value. So uh, I, I sourced the, the 356 in Australia. Um, I found it online uh, up in Queensland because I, I was in Europe at the time. Um, had a couple of people go and look at it for me, inspect the car, make sure it was everything that was sort of made out to be in the in the in the ad, um, and, birch, and purchase it basically sight unseen. Fantastic. So it would have been how long had was this process of purchase car getting trucked or driven down to Melbourne or Mansfield, whichever, until you saw it? How long had was the car? Basically, uh, uh, you know, probably around six months. Oh yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of foreplay. 
Yeah, it's purchased around six months between when I when I purchased it and when I actually uh, saw it. So um, again, leaned on a bunch of mates here in Australia, um, had it trucked down to a, a car dealership that I know uh, from someone who in Melbourne that I knew, um, had a mate pick it up and drive it out to a warehouse uh, where it was stored by, it was actually stored by uh, Jerry Ryan, who's, uh, you know, from, from Jayco Caravan, a large supporter of cycling. Uh, he had a big warehouse uh, on the outskirts of Melbourne. And he he let, let me sit it there for the year where it was covered up until I finally got back uh, back to Australia and saw it for the first time. Yeah, fantastic. I can imagine that would have been uh, pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, I'd seen the images and everyone was giving me updates and on the car. Yeah, seen plenty um, of photos of your car getting driven around by everyone but you, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Tell me, um, you mentioned uh, being in Monaco at the time and any car enthusiast knows it's like one of the centres of the universe when it comes to high-end sports cars and luxury cars. It would have, uh, the, the only cars that, I've, like I've, been fortunate enough to be there a couple of times myself over the years and the only cars that actually stop traffic that aren't the norm are the classics when you see a classic you know 60s ferrari or a 60s maserati or a 60s porsche they're the ones that actually everyone goes gaga about over there so it does really prove the level of class that the uh you know that those vehicles have in so having having the 356 would have been pretty special in monaco as well i could imagine if the opportunity had ever presented itself yeah, there were a couple of floating around Monaco. You didn't see too many, not near as much as as, uh, as Ferraris and, and, and modern sports cars. But one of my favourite times of year in Monaco was actually um, for the historic Grand Prix. Yeah, yeah. Because that's when all the real car enthusiasts would, would come to town. The, 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 the F1 in Monaco was sort of the glitz and glamour. Everybody who wanted to be seen was in town. But a couple of weeks before that, or, or a month before that, I can't remember how much long, how long exactly it was. Yeah, it was, was when the historical race was in town, and then you would see some of these classic old old sport cars, which was, yeah, was a great time of year. Mm-hmm. The um, with your experience of uh, living in the region and um, that type of thing, did you consider buying a car in Europe, a classic car there for all that period? Or was it always going to be I'm going to end up? settling back in australia so I'll, I'll i'll source one there and just leave it there and let dad and my mates look after it or you know had you considered actually keeping you know a car like that in europe during you know the process of uh looking for one when i was looking for one i did look around a little bit uh in europe um i looked a little bit in the uk but they sort of didn't have a great reputation for being well kept in the uk um so i did look around quite a lot but the one that I found in Australia eventually seemed to tick all the boxes. Sure. Uh, so that's that kind of that's what I settled with. Uh, did it have to be silver? No, it didn't. It didn't have to be silver. Um, I like I love the 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 one the, the the first three five six I saw was was a red one just like yours. Um, but it didn't have to be silver. But I thought you know the silver color was was amazing. And the goal was like I want, I'd love to get a. I always said I'd love to get a. A, a coupe for my, my 30th and the goal was always to get a speed step for my 40th but funnily enough they went up too much in value over, that, say, over, that, that, 10 years, for <laughs> over that 10 year period uh, yeah. and I didn't end up with the speed yeah. stuff you probably should have done it the other way around uh yes I should have definitely done it the other way around <laughs> and um you have a family children yes yeah I have a tribe of children so I have four kids uh well, the, yeah okay the, the older three were born abroad, and and the littlest one was only born earlier this year. So we have a very busy house. So it's not a not a lot of seat space left in the three five six when Dad let's go down the shops. No, 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 no none whatsoever. But it's really nice. Um, every now and then, I try and do something with one of the older kids, and you know, take them out for lunch or just fish and chips or something like that. Where yep. um, we'll, we'll take the three five six out, and they really enjoy getting out in the in that three five six it's you know it's noisy it's yeah, it's rough yeah. and ready and they they love it they love the attention it draws as well yeah I, I, there's certainly um yeah i've got an eight-year-old daughter so I, I know with the attention it's they like the idea that people are looking at them in the car but in reality no one knows who's in the car they're just looking at the car when people look at it so i, I find it an incredibly good car to drive around and be anonymous because no one actually looks at who's in it no, that's right. That's right. And yeah, and like you said, the kids love it because it's not it's not like the regular car that they're riding. It's a little bit different. So. Yeah, Dad, where do I plug my iPad in? Uh, yeah, they're not quite there yet. Mine doesn't even have a radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, mine doesn't either. <laughs> and um, so how has um, moving back to Australia after, you know, 
let's face it, by the sounds of it, you spent more you spent more time in Europe than Australia as a, as a, you know as a human up to the point of moving back. How's the um, adjustment gone? Like your oh, three older kids, they all speak English well. Yeah, yeah. All my all my kids sort of speak English as a first language. That's what we always spoke at home. Uh, but the oldest two kids were born in Monaco. The littlest one was born. Uh, the just sort of third child was born in in London when we lived there for a couple of years before coming back. And like I said, uh, and then we have a, a new baby that was born born in Melbourne in January. Um, it's been a big adjustment to move back after 21 years away. Um, we've always had a very, very strong alliance with Australia. We'd always come back here nearly every year for Christmas uh, and whatnot. But, um, yeah, to finally settle back here, uh, it's been a big change. Obviously, the kids are, are changing schools um, and just building a new sort of network of friends uh, here as well, locally to where we've moved to. Um, but, uh, yeah, for the family, it's been a really good, really good move. Working in the cycling industry, is, is a bit of a challenge, particularly when so much of my work is based around what's happening professionally too. I, I was going to ask, what if now that you're not doing that part of your life anymore of, you know, having to get up and, you know, sit on the bike for six or seven hours a day type thing, what, we, what are you going to be when you grow up? I'm going to be just like you actually, Mark. Um, I, I own a 356 and I run a chain of bike shops. So I work with a business called The Service Course, um, and we have a chain of uh, bike shops throughout uh, yeah, throughout Europe. So we have one in Spain, one in France, one in Norway, actually one in the UK. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a cycling retail business. We also have a, a travel element, which has been very quiet for the past 12 months or so. Um, and we have an online shop. So the website is called theservicecourse.cc. Sure. Um, we do our own brand clothing and, and specialise in, in custom bikes. So much like classic cars, we sort of do the... The bike version we spoke we focus on 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 really high end um, custom built bikes. Oh, it sounds great! So I'll I'll put all the links to that detail below in the uh, video here and also on the podcast. And with your um, with your life change in general, has the, have the are the kids very aware of the profile you had as an athlete yet? You know, even the older ones. Yeah, the older ones are very aware of, of what I was doing for a job uh, when we were in Europe. Uh, yeah, every now and then they would come come to a race. They were able to be present in a couple of um, of my results as well. And they used to watch on TV. So they have a very strong understanding uh, yeah, okay, of what, what, what I used to do. The, obviously, the little ones are too small to know. My my uh, my two little ones are only sort of 19 months and four months old. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, so it may be in the future, but the older two have a very good understanding and um, but funnily enough, my, my son, he's really passionate about soccer. He's absolutely mad for it. Um, going through his early school years in, in uh, Monaco, Andorra, and then London, it was all about, all about football there, so sure. soccer. Yep. Um, and my little girl is sort of into dancing and singing and playing the piano. So they haven't, they haven't come to cycling yet. Um, and if they choose to, you know, we'll support that. But that's got to be on their terms. Yeah, it's great. Great to hear as a, um, an ex-pro, you know, that you're not shoving it down their throat. Because there's, there's plenty of um, children of ex uh, children of ex athletes who don't live up to the promise that mum or dad did. There's no doubt about that, and you know, seems to be such a, a, a absorbed so much of their life to not deliver on the you know the hope that they ever would. But that aside, the you've had some fairly prominent race results in the past you know, won some of the biggest races in the world and, you know, outside of the Tour de France win of Cadell Evans, possibly, I'm sure, historically one of the most successful bike races Australia's produced. I know that headline races aren't always the greatest moment of a professional cyclist that they've won. It often involves the lead-up energy or challenges to get to any particular event. What was the real... What's the moment for you that you're looking back on now thinking, yeah, that was a one or that, or if, when you cross the line to take a victory or even support a teammate to victory, is there one particular moment you look at and go, yeah, that was, that was pretty much as good as it got for me. Do you have that moment in your career? Yeah. I have a, a, a few moments that I'm really, that I really look back on fondly in, in my career. Um, as you mentioned, I had a couple of really nice wins um, throughout the journey, had some great success at the Tour de France. Um, and I won a sort of couple of big classic races, uh, the Milan San Remo in Italy and sort of the Liège Best on Liège 
uh, in, in Belgium were the sort of two standout classic wins that I had. But like you said, I have some really fond memories of just being part of some team wins as well. In my second ever Tour de France in, in 2006, I was racing as a part of the AG Tour Provence team. And my teammate in that year, quite early on in the Tour de France, um, ended up, you know, got in a breakaway and ended up in the yellow jersey. So he was leading the race. So it was then on the, onto the team for the next day to defend that yellow jersey. So I'll never forget the moment of, of leading the peloton um, that was largely through f- f- riddled with my, with my hero. So I was still very new to the sport uh, or new to the professional peloton. Um, and I'm riding on the front of the bunch, you know, and, and setting a tempo and, and, and dropping a number of these guys one by one to try and defend the yellow jersey of, of uh, the guy's name was Cyril Dessel. So I kind of reflect on, on those sort of po- points in my career and go, that wow, that was amazing. Um, that was a, such a huge honour to be leading the tour uh, or leading the, the, the peloton at the Tour de France um, in, my, in my second tour. So, yeah, there is sort of a number of points, I guess, as far as the – the standout result for me would have been my, my victory at, uh, at Liège, best on Liège. Um, and purely because it was a race that so much work went into over so many years to finally get that win. Um, Liège was a, a race that I participated in nearly every year of my career. And I th- think it took me three or four editions to even finish. Um, it was such a, such a grueling event. But slowly by slowly, I got better and better at the race until I was finishing near the front group and then finally at the front of the race where I eventually won it in 2014. Of uh, of the, I guess, key victories that I look at of your career, I do. Um, I've watched. I was watching them on TV. You know when they happened. I don't recall you driving the peloton from that. You know early in your career there, but I do remember watching you, your first tour stage victory. I remember watching the victory in Milan San Remo, and that was, you know, for a an Aussie spectator, such an iconic race. And, you know, that was, you know, it was jumping up and down on the couch type material, especially the way it finished. And in Liège as well, it was, you know, very for me as a fan of cycling, I was very uh, fortunate to watch those events as they unfolded and happened, you know. So for, as you like I said, as a fan, it was great. Back on the Porsche stuff, I know that Porsche Cars Australia have ambassadors and stuff like that. They approached you to do anything with them since you've returned to Melbourne because that really is the home of Porsche Cars in Australia as well. Uh, no, they haven't. And, you know, I've only been back for a few months now, so I really haven't had the opportunity to uh, to do too much with my car since I've been back. But uh, I don't know the guys at Porsche Australia. I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably good mates with with Mark Webber, who has, obviously has a very strong association with Porsche. He does. Uh, I got to know, know him throughout his, his racing career. He was always... Uh, cycling a lot for, for fitness and, and following the sport of cycling. So, um, yeah, I've had a, a fair bit to do with Mark. So, uh, yeah. So I'm maybe, Monaco resident, I understand? Uh, yeah, but of recent years. He was always UK-based when he was uh, yeah. uh, he was competing. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but he would spend a bit of time in Monaco, obviously, around the Grand Prix, and um, a number of his his colleagues were uh, guys that I'd ride with uh, on uh, during the weekend and, and hang out with as well. Yeah, sure. So well, I know the F1's coming up in uh, in Melbourne there in November, so I'm sure you'll have the opportunity to catch up with him when he's back in town and see if he can wing you into one of those cars at the celebrity race or something. I reckon that would be okay, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be good <laughs> to do would... a couple of, be good to do a couple of laps with with Mark behind the wheel. I think that'd be an experience. Yeah, I think it would be an experience, it would be an understatement. The um how have you found the transition out of professional athlete into normal society and not the bubble that I guess a professional athlete lives in compared to the rest of us. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big transition for, I think, for anyone changing careers. Um, That's a good point. At yeah. sort of, at sort of in their, you know, late 30s or around 40 years of age and, and stepping out of what is a relatively comfortable zone. You know, cycling is really hard, but when you know it inside out, you, you're very aware of, of what's going on. And it's only when you get outside that bubble that you're just talking about that you're aware of a whole wide world that goes on um, everywhere else um, and which you've been largely sheltered from 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 your entire adult life. So it is a big change. Um, There is a lot to take on and deal with um, that you only become aware of afterwards. And I guess the other thing you kind of realise, sport in professional sport exactly there are massive highs and then massive lows on a consistent basis like your whole life is a roller coaster getting outside it 
in relative terms, regular life is pretty flat line. You know, it does go up and down a little bit, but not to the same degree as as professional sport when you're, you know, you're basically put on the on the line week in, week out on the on the world stage with with a massive global audience. So um, it does take some time to adjust. I've managed to, you know, I feel like I've adjusted reasonably well just by simply keeping myself really busy. Um, yeah. I always had projects to focus on. I stepped straight into a, a new job as soon as I finished uh, finished cycling. So I didn't really have the time to sort of sit back and and reflect for too long or or contemplate what I was going to do next. Yep, yep, sure. That's, well, that's great here. It's uh, and it it sounds like you're very grounded and are aware of the, I guess, privileged lifestyle you enjoyed prior to having to do what the rest of us do, drop kids off school and things like that. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, you, you kind of look back and go, just when I was racing, someone else used to do this for me. Yeah, they're called uh, vibes, aren't they? Yeah, and now I'm doing it uh, myself. But, yeah, I had a very supportive family uh, network while I was competing uh, and they're still very much around. Um, and I think, yeah, there's nothing keep you, keeps you grounded like kids too. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt. And uh, with you have any? Um, I, I was I skipped a question. I did want to prompt you about, and that was you mentioned you, you saw a three five six from somebody was it? I think a bike shop owner. That was your insight to it. Had you had any experience with Porsche in your life up to that point as a brand, like driven cars, owned cars, anything other prior to that? No, uh, none whatsoever. No, okay. I, like I said, I grew up sort of in country Victoria in a sort of pretty sort of, I guess you would say it was a middle class, you know, family uh, and in a, in a farming community. So there weren't too many Porsches uh, around uh, where, where I grew up. It was only probably once I moved to, to Melbourne that I sort of become a bit more aware of the brand. Um, whereas these days, you know, Porsche four drives are, are riddled throughout country Victoria with everyone going up to their holiday houses. Yeah, I can uh, imagine. Yeah. So no, I didn't have uh, exposure to any uh, to any sort of Porsches or anything growing up. Um, my grandfather was a real car enthusiast. Uh, he used to sort of race at club level uh, locally up uh, across at Winton. Um, yep. I think he was one of the founding members of the of the of the club there, um, and he drove Jags when, in his younger day. Uh, yeah, okay. So he was, uh, we always sort of, there was always an interest in, in cars and motorsport within the family, um, but nobody really had the, uh, had the luxury of a nice car when I was growing up. Sure. I'd like, I think back in that era of you growing up, the staple motor vehicles of farmers in Australia was like either a Fairlane or a Statesman or something like that. So the, um, I'm, you know, I know what it was like in Victoria because I'm a Victorian myself. And, um, you know, when I think about all those dusty cars coming into Geelong, Growing up, they're always the you know the big Aussie Luxo cars that seem to run forever and do about seven hundred thousand kilometres before they're replaced. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I think uh, I think the the cars in the country clock up more more miles than, than anywhere else with the sort of runs in and out of town. Yeah, um, I think you're right. From the farming communities and whatnot into the into the bigger community hubs. Mm-hmm. And uh, any plans to get a modern sports car moving forward in life, or now that you've got a family that size, you do you have to drive a minibus everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, the one sort of modern nice car that I had um, while I was in Europe and, and, and we only had two kids, I drove an RS6 for a number of years, which was a, which was a beautiful uh, car, the, the Audi um, station wagon. Um, and that was, you know, your family wagon, you flick a button, it turned into a race car. So that was a really nice car to, to belt around Europe uh, big, in. Big car to own in Monaco. Yeah, big car to own in Monaco, but, you know, it was very rare that I, was, I wasn't going somewhere without a bike in the boot. So yeah, yeah. that that kind of extra space um, was always handy, but yes, you're right. Very big car for the tight parks uh, within within Monaco. Um, as far as a modern sports car these days, funnily enough, I kind of parked that idea when when baby number three came along, sure. and thought, you know, my, my dream of driving driving the family around a sports car has gone. So um, I bought myself a motorbike so I can escape on my own yeah, and yeah. and a, and a car and a van so I can get all the family around and and motorbikes in the back too. Yeah, so yeah, okay, good one. And um, you have a motorcycle now? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of motorcycles. Yeah. Um, what do you? Yeah, I, I bought a, a. Funnily enough, a, a mate of mine is a an ex racer. He raced in the World uh, Superbike Super Sport Series for a number of years. So I bought his super bo- his super sport race bike, so a, a six hundred. Um, at the end of a season a few years ago, it's a couple of years old now. So it's um, from sort of, I think it's around 2010. So I've got his bike there um, that, I could, that I use for, for track days. 
so it's purely a track bike. And it's because I never got my uh, three, five, six, uh, my speed stuff for my uh, my fortieth, I bought myself a, a Cafe Racer BMW. So not quite at the same oh, nice at the same level, but it's a um, yeah, it's a nineteen eighty one um, uh, BMW, which was r- restored and and done up bespoke for me. Sounds like you got a, a bit of a commitment to garage space there in Melbourne, mate. Yes, in in our new house, yeah, I put quite a big quite a big basement in actually, so I can keep all the all the toys off street <laughs> and and undercover. Yep, yep. Oh, good. Sounds like you've uh, you're in, you're enjoying your automotive and uh, motorcycling time back in Australia. Anyway, I really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat to us, have a bit of insight to what life was like as a um, professional cyclist, and you know. It's great to see your enthusiasm for our listeners' favourite brand and mine. So <laughs> um, I'll be over in Melbourne come Formula One time. Be great to catch up, go for a spin. Love to see the car up close if the opportunity presents itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it'd be great to be great to, to get out for a ride with you and, and show show you show you my car. I'll show you a couple of my toys anyway. Fantastic. Thanks very much for your time today, Simon. I really appreciate it. No worries, Mark. My pleasure.